Okay, dear colleagues, students, and all members of the audience, uh, welcome to our UCA Public Lecture Series. Uh, I am Soleil Shafi, Chair of Communications and Media Department and Acting Associate Dean at Naryn Campus. This is a great delight and honor for me to act as, as the moderator today, and I will roll out the session by way of a brief introduction. The topic to be delivered and discussed today by our speaker, Professor Maxim Komiakov, is Horizons of Revolutionary Time, Russia and the Logic of Social Transformation in the 20th Century. Professor Maxim Komiakov is Dean of the School of Arts and Sciences at the University of Central Asia. Prior to joining UCA, Professor Komiakov was Director of the Center for Advanced Studies and Education at Ural Federal University and a visiting fellow at the University of Johannesburg. Professor Komiakov also served as Vice Director of Higher School of Economics at St. Petersburg campus and Vice President at Ural Federal University. Today's topic is not only intellectually stimulating and thought provoking, but rather is timely and resonates deeply with the lived experience of many in the audience. In what way do revolutions emerge? Around their course of evolution and what is the contingency of the outcome in relation to this process? Man is born free and everywhere he is in chains. The opening sentence of Rousseau in his seminal work, The Social Contract. The statement draws attention to the age old question of freedom, the most important mark of human life, which is curtailed by physical restrictions and constantly hedged around with all manner of sociopolitical conditions. We have been told that revolution is a way of breaking out of chains. However, as history tells us, revolution is not to break out of chains, but to replace them only with new ones. Here lies a contradiction and the locus of tensions between expectation and lived experience. Professor Homiakov will take us through the consciousness of revolution as a historical phenomenon and the complexity and nuances of the chasm between the ideal and the actual that lies deep in its foundation. There will be time at the end for question and answers. You can either appear on the screen and put up your questions directly or you can write them down in the chat box and I will read them out in the order of their post. Professor Khamiyakov, it is over to you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sukhil, for a <clears throat> for nice introduction. And, uh, well, I will try uh, today uh, to be, you know, kind of informal. I will not uh, read the paper, although the paper is written. And um, uh, but, well, this is kind of a paper in progress. This is what uh, I'm uh, doing now together with um, um, you know quite quite uh, famous sociologist uh, from Barcelona, Peter Wagner. And we, I mean, the question we we are trying to pose is uh, the meaning and. Um, um, you know, the destiny of revolution in contemporary world, but we take the example of Russia as, um, you know, one of the most important, of course, cases of revolutionary behavior and of the development of revolutionary action. So let me now share my screen and uh, I will try to proceed. Okay, let me, from the beginning, can you see it's okay? Yes, it looks fantastic. Good, good. So the, uh, the um, you know, uh, title of the talk is Horizon of the Revolutionary Time, and I will try to explain what I mean. Um, but I will start with two pictures. I mean, the first picture is the picture of Delacroix, is of course the freedom on, on the barricades. And this is a one part of the revolutionary imaginary. I mean, this is a breaking up chains. This is, uh, you know, um, kind of freeing the freedom um, together with, you know, all kind of 
um, ordinary people breaking through old regime and you know establishing a new freer and just uh, society and there is a second imaginary imaginary which is um well which is not exactly about revolution uh this is about saturn who who is eating his own children but this is a famous goya painting but this is also there is also this famous phrase about the revolution that revolution is also eating um its own its own children so we have kind of two very different imaginary or imaginaries of the of the of the revolution and my talk today is about imaginaries how revolution imagined the world and most importantly how revolution through social imaginary construct the time and with the time with temporality it constructs the world it's going to build or to destroy so i will start with the claim that revolution and modernity um you know until very recently um always were kind of these two concepts were thought as rather interconnected um well as a matter of fact uh you know there is a kind of um uh commonplace in saying that uh you know we lived in the long 19th century from 1789 up to 19 um up to 1914 uh, uh, and uh, short 20th century from 1914 to 1991. So, you know, the 19th century ended with the First World War and 20th century ended with the collapse of Soviet Union. We can also change a bit. And if we change this uh, date, uh, like 1914 or 1915 with 1917, we will kind of change the optic of uh, of our of our thoughts and we then will pay attention to the three main revolutionary periods in the um in the european in the european history so one is uh, you know the first starts with french revolution and ends with well basically a restoration with the uh, vienna congress the second one which is around 1905 1919 or 199 or 1923 this is the uh, this is the epoch around russian revolution and you know the third one is starts with the prague uh, spring in 1968 and ends in kind of 1999 1989 1991 with the collapse of soviet union so three main revolutionary periods in the history of european modernity they are marking radical transformation of modernity we can say that each of these epochs you know starting you kind of understanding you imaginary of what modern society is modern politics is modern anthropology is um well basically what we are talking about when we are talking about revolution um of course uh, the very word revolution uh, has always been used in kind of circular manner revolution is uh, well revoluzio like in copernicus the revolutionibus orbit orbium celestium so about the revolution of the uh, of the planets basically of the um of the celestial uh, celestial uh, circles or like saint augustine um, in his de civitate dei says on platonism he uh, there is his um you know words on 
per diversa corpora revoluciones, where revoluciones means transmigration of the soul from one body to another in, Plato in, Platonic, in Platonic thought. So revolutio is something which is, you know, which, which goes on circles. However, when we are talking about modern revolution, this, uh, this word, uh, you know, no more refers to anything circular. When we are talking about the great French revolution, the revolution of 1789, um, the idea is that, that this is kind of a forward moment, movement. This is the movement which brings about the progress and it is imagined as a driver of social, of social change or like in Marx, like in, uh, like in uh, Russian Bolshevism or uh, communism, the main driver of the change. So, um, a launch, uh, you know, with the revolution of 19 of 1789, we experience really, you know, the start of political modernity. We are we we experiencing the start of the talks about the rights of the citizens and human beings, and on you know, kind of human rights, but also on the popular sovereignty, you know, and all things basically concepts which are somehow related and connected to what we understand what we understand of in political modernity okay so um french revolution somehow mark a rupture in the fabric of time it marks uh, you know the beginning of modernity uh, so what happens uh, in uh, during the revolution of 1789. Uh, Reinhard uh, Kazelek, uh, the famous uh, founder of the Begriffsgeschichte, um, you know, the history of the concepts um, theory, uh, he, in his analysis, he says that um, in, um, in the French Revolution and in the revolution as such, uh, what happens is the horizon of our expectations is now entirely separated from the space of experience. What does it mean? It means that what we expect is no more defined by what we experience. It's no more defined by, you know, our history. It is imagined as autonomously, as absolutely freely, you know, of any kind of uh, circumstances or social circumstances in which we are living. So uh, a revolution then uh, in this separation of the expectations from the experiences, Revolution opens up the tem temporal horizon, the horizon of the future. And this horizon of the future is not limited anymore by the history of particular society, of particular human beings, etc. I mean, this is very interesting and this is very unstable period because it is very difficult to live uh, in this unbearable openness of the of the uh, of the future when you know more or less everything possible interestingly russian revolution reacts the french revolution and um, uh, you know well 19th century basically um, understood french revolution as incomplete and basically failed revolution because after Vienna Congress, um, after 1815, um, you know, well, the old regime was basically restored in Europe. So, um, you know, the idea of Russian revolution or behind Russian revolution was uh, to fulfill the promises, to fulfill the promises of the French one. Uh, even if we can talk, and some people are talking like Arneson or, um, or 
the same Peter Wagner, but more, more like Arnason are talking about alternative modernity of the Soviet Union or failed modernity of the Soviet Union. In many respects, these alternative pathways actually paralleled trajectories of Western modernity. So I think that the unique place of Russian revolution in this imaginary, in the modern imaginary, um, is defined by the way Russian revolution kind of relates to the French one and at the same time, you know, go beyond it. So implement in a way the promises, uh, the promises, uh, radical promises of the French, of the French revolution. If we understand the revolution time in this way, if we understand that revolution, um, you know, break uh, expectations from the experiences. Um, interesting question to ask is what really happens in this gap between experiences and, and expectations? What really happens, um, you know, when human being um, feel that they are no more limited by their own history, but at the same time, they have this huge, as I said, unbearable openness of the future in front, in front of them. Um, well, there was a, after Vienna Congress, I mean, I will go before going to, uh, to Russian revolution, just let me just very briefly, uh, describe uh, what happened in 19th century, as I understand it. The failure of the French Revolution created this discrepancy between the reality or experiences on the one hand and expectations on the other hand. Um, because the French Revolution produced rad a radical imaginary but failed to introduce this, um, uh, to implement it in practice. Um, hence, 19th century, um, well, sometimes is seen as the epoch of the ideologists, you know, the main ideologies of now, of, of today's, actually were created and developed during 19th century. And I mean, at least, you know, the four, five main ideological, um, ideological movements, uh, like conservatism, who, which actually search to close the future and to return to the real life, return to the experiences, you know, and live, uh, you know, as if this radical opening of the future has never happened, had never happened. Nationalism uh, basically is an attempt to construct the future upon the basis of one particular experience, not of the whole history, but on the basis of uh, cultural and linguistic commonality, cultural and linguistic community, uh, which is called basically nation. Liberalism took liberty, just one, um, one element of the radical imaginary, um, of the French Revolution, it's liberty and equality, right? Two things. So liberalism took liberty in the heart of uh, the social and political transformation it, uh, it uh, claimed, uh, it tried to implement. While socialism and communism, they both took fraternity, uh, which actually was equality, or which then has been transformed to solidarity as its main, it's the main basis of this, of this ideology. So, um, well, the difference between socialism and communism in this respect is also clear because socialism claimed that after French Revolution, the future would naturally develop in kind of linear evolutionary type of the progress that, well, it's enough to have one opening up of the future. And then, you know, the first implementation will come through a set 
of uh, you know kind of reforms in evolutionary manner. While communism said that uh, basically uh, communism sought reacting the French Revolution and uh, complete uh, complete what it really started. So the difference between the two ideologies was really the difference in understanding the role of the revolution in the society. So it was communism of all ideologies um, of the 19th century who, which kind of tried to maintain and develop the concept and the notion of the revolution, starting from the French Revolution onwards. So Russian Revolution, when it happened, it opened up the future again, and this future was even more radically opened than in, in the French one. And because of its apparent success, um, Russian, because never restoration never came, you know, until very lately. Um, Russian Revolution um, dominated radical imaginary for the whole 20th century. All kind of left, um, you know, wing um, you know, people, including democratic left, including socialists, uh, they just somehow had to refer to Russian Revolution as kind of a founding, founding point. So this is really important event crucial event for understanding the, uh, for understanding modernity, at least European modernity. Um, now, the question is what happens uh, in this gap between expectations and experiences? When expectations is, are no more defined by experiences? In a way, this is a particular type of time. And many uh, uh, theorists actually try to understand this type of the time through comparison of this time with, um, with religious uh, messianic time, the time of Messiah, all kind of religion, millenarism, um, uh, kind of kind, type of time. So, for example, Birdiaev famously uh, saw the main sources of Russian communism in Russian millenarist Christian Christian movements. Dostoevsky um, famously, you know, saw the great inquisitor in his brother Karamazov um, uh, novel the great inquisitor as a kind of um, expressor of the socialist views on the one hand or communist views on the one hand, and on the other hand, uh, you know, kind of uh, prominent Catholic, um, you know, ex those who express, uh, you know, the foundations of the, of the Catholic thought. So for Dostoevsky, Socialism is just a perversion of the of the Christian, of Christianity. Um, Herzen, uh, famous Russian uh, philosopher of, of uh, you know the first half of nineteenth century, he talked about socialists and communists, socialists at this time, as new barbarians and new Christians who come to destroy the old world and to create new civilization on this um, on this uh, you know destroyed uh, destroyed basically empty space um, and uh, I also quote here uh, Yuri Slyoskin who is a um, I think he is in, in Harvard or in Yale for the moment uh, but he, he's American American um, historian uh, Russian basically American historian um, of uh, history, and uh, he basically talks on Bolsheviks as of a millenarian Christian sect. So, well, in different time, different people saw um, 
kind of analogy between uh, millenarist religious movements and and radical uh, and radical revolutionary uh, revolutionary parties. Um, for me, I mean, it both does make sense. It does not. I mean, uh, it does not make sense to understand, you know, just literally, um, uh, you know, revolutionists as uh, you know Christian millenarists as Sloskin does. So he interprets Stalin's time as kind of uh, transformation of the, uh, you know, kind of millenary sect into the church. Uh, well, I would not go that far. However, I think that, um, you know, there, is, there are some uh, structural similarities between uh, radical religious and radical and radical um, uh, revolutionary imaginaries. Um, so I took uh, St. Paul as, you know, the author of the Messianic time who, you know, know who is known to me more than any, any other. So I took Christian, Christian tradition. Um, now, um, in, well, St. Paul referred to this messianic time, the time of his life as a kairos, as kind of a moment, is a kind of very unique moment in history, very unique moment in time. And the uniqueness of this moment is first, because he says, the time is short, brothers. But short in Greek, he used the word tumestalmenos, which means contracted, which means shortened, very kind of intensive. And I would, I think it's also very important, and we, I, I, will, I will then show you why, that this tumestalmenos in Greek language also mean uh, the animal, uh, in kind of contracted state, which is preparing to jump. So before jumping, you know, animal is sunastelmenos. So the, this is kind of the kairos. This is the moment of time when time contracted and prepared to jump like an animal. Um, second, um, main um, kind of element of, of this uh, millenarist time is the, in, why intensity? Why contracted? Because this is very intense expectation of parousia. Um, you know, early Christians forgot about their own experience. They lived with expectation of the second coming of Jesus. And this expectation was so intense that, uh, that St. Paul says, we shall not all sleep, which means we shall not all die, but we shall all be changed. So the idea of at this time was that Russia is so closed, is so close, sorry, that uh, present generation will see the second uh, coming of Christ. Actually, for, uh, for St. Paul and for some of the Christian, early Christian communities, it was a problem when people started to die because they thought that Christians would see uh, Jesus coming and you know, the resurrection of the world and the last judgment, it will be tomorrow. Uh, so we shall not all sleep but we shall all be changed. And this is an important, important characteristic of this, of, of the Kairos. And so this is a time of radical transformation. This is a time when people forgot about their about the experiences. I just have this lengthy quotation from the New Testament. From now on, those who have wives should live as if they do not. Those who mourn as if they do not, they did not. Those who are happy as if they were not. 
those who buy something if it's real not theirs to keep, those who use the things of the world as if not engrossed in them, for this world in its present form is passing away. So no experience matter anymore. Giorgio Agamben, um, you know, famous um, Italian philosopher, says that this common or horse man is if. This is ultimate meaning of vacation of the classes. You know, Christian who, uh, a devoted Christian who is living in this time um, is, has this Christian vacation. It means that, you know, for him uh, or her, the experiences, past experiences do not matter anymore. And this is not the end of time. This is not as haton as such. Uh, this is the time of the end. This is the time of, you know, of people, people live there, but they live in very peculiar, in very peculiar situation. Now, what about revolution? I mean, this is an analogy. Um, a revolutionary kairos, a revolutionary, uh, kind of unique moment in time. It's also intensive and contracted. Engels, and hence, you know, very handy this analogy with the animal in contracted states, you know, who prepare to jump, to leap. You know, Engels famous saying that revolution or, you know, well, this kind of time is a leap from kingdom of necessity to the kingdom of freedom. So you can compare with uh, this St. Paul's understanding of the time. And it is very intense expectation of the new world. I, I cannot, I mean, it's short talk. I cannot go into much details, but um, there was a very interesting Russian ideology of late 19th century who tried to unite Christianity and positivism, Christianity and science, and uh, of Nikolai Fyodorov. And uh, this guy proclaimed that the science will be so powerful that they, it can implement, um, you know, religious tasks. Uh, well, it will, uh, it will uh, kind of steer the movements of the stars, and finally, it will be able to resurrect uh, those who, who are dead. So they resurrect the parents, and this was the project of the Fyodorov. One of his, one of, but this was before revolution, but one of his, um, one of his disciples, Gorsky, he actually believed that he would not die, even when, you know, because revolution opened possibility to implement the project of Fyodorov. And he believed it when, even when he was dying in Gulag, you know, after he was arrested and repressed in, in Gulag. So this kind of intense expectation of the new radical, um, of the new world, radically transformed world, and this is, of course, time of the radical transformation. Um, so, uh, well, we can refer here to the Tr to Trotsky's theory of permanent revolution, for example. Like, um, well, Trotsky says that, uh, you know, revolution should not stop. Revolution should be permanent. Um, it, because, uh, you know, it only starts with democratic a revolution like February Revolution in uh, in Russia, and then it proceeds to socialist revolution. So there is a continuity between the two. Um, permanent revolution means also total revolutionization of the society. So you know you have economic revolution, then you have you have political revolution, then economic revolution, then revolution in moral, then cultural revolution. You never stop. You know it's. Uh, Revolution should continue until the whole world would be uh, would be uh, transformed, 
and revolution has this planetary nature. Um, you know, the revolution is world revolution. It cannot be just in one uh, in one uh, in one country. Um, Mayakovsky uh, famously wrote one of his poems about my uh, not native, but the place in which I lived the most um, the most of my life, and this is. Uh, this is Yekaterinburg or Sverdlovsk at this, at this time. He, he wrote uh, in this way. This is, uh, well, there is a height that a skyscraper gladly would borrow while alongside the remnants of Heldum Gray, as if the city has no today, but only yesterday and tomorrow. Um, well, in Russian, it's, it's better, I think. Polonibaskrebali sami podnyal, što v elektrichestvi myt vichera, a riadam grip, Дыра преисподняя, как будто у города нету сегодня, а только завтра и вчера. Uh, which means, uh, well, the time of the revolution does not, it's time of, you know, Trotsky's kind of reconfiguration always, you know, kind of permanent reconfiguration and transformation of the world, but this is, uh, this is time which uh, which has only which has only future and past. There is no there is no present. There is no. It's like, I mean, another Christian example. Uh, uh, Clement of Rome um, uh, were uh, referring to uh, to the church as paroikusa in Rome. Uh, well, which is staying in Rome, not existing in Rome, not living in Rome, but staying in Rome, uh, you know, temporary, because this is, not, this is not the place for the church. The place for the church is, is the, the heaven. Uh, the place of the church is the, is the God's kingdom. Uh, or St. Augustine is talking about Civitas Dei Peregrina, the city of, of God in pilgrimage in this world. Okay, so this is kind of the um, feeling of the world, the feeling of the, of, of the temporality. Now we have past and we have kind of present and we have future, but future exists in the present, like these skyscrapers in Yekaterinburg. Um, but this future in the past, uh, is very precar precarious. Revolution uh, is supposed to create new experiences, which then rationalize the most radical expectations. So re what revolution tried to achieve is to create new worlds, create new experiences on which really radical expectations of the revolution uh, will be rationally Based. Hence, you know, we have all these aporias of revolution, uh, which the majority of them are connected to the contradiction between freedom and necessity, right? This is a leap from kingdom of necessity to the kingdom of freedom. But what happens, you know, during this leap, during this revolution, it's both necessity and freedom mixed somehow together. Um, hence, many contradictions, many aporias, like, you know, well, Lukács says that, well, of course, revolutions are happened because of the objective crisis. So there is a nature of things which develops the revolution, but at the same time, it's impossible without free, autonomous, revolutionary action, heroic action of the revolutionary party. Uh, it's both both necessity and freedom. Um, you know, well, many Marxists were talking about false consciousness of proletariat. Proletariat does not understand uh, its own interests, really. Uh, that's why the vanguard Communist Party should teach proletariat. And this is also kind of, um, kind of aporia because uh, you have proletariat, which is 
you know, the future, um, you know, dominant class. And somehow, uh, you know, it uh, does not understand its own, uh, its own destiny, its, its own interest. Or just one more example, and I proceed further. Um, in before, before Russian Revolution, uh, they were, you know, radical Democrats, and they were ridiculed by Vladimir Solovyov, very famous Russian uh, philosopher of uh, the uh, end of 19th century, that they, he said that they somehow uh, act according to very strange syllogism. They say that we all are descendants of the, of the apes, of the monkeys, and the conclusion they draw from this, from this Darwinism that we should love each other. We should, we should somehow be heroic. So they uh, try to, um, uh, to determine you know, heroic actions with, with you know, kind of revolutionary Darwinism, which is, of course, does not, that does not hold. I mean, you, it, it, there is no logic in this. But th th this is a logic of revolution. This is a logic of the mix between uh, between necessity and uh, and the freedom. Okay, I would probably speed up. I already don't don't have much time. So what happens actually in revolution uh, in revolution time in the very beginning um, uh, in the very in the very beginning of uh, of you know revolution immediately after 19, 1917, uh, you know, with this opening, all possibilities, all possible, all possible horizons of all possible expectations, they will attempt to try to bridge uh, experiences and expectations. And I already referred to Fyodorov and to his project. And, uh, you know, there was a, another Fyodorov's disciple, Valerian Muravyov, who wrote the uh, wrote book which is called Mastering of the Time of Ladenia Vremenim, where he says basically that through obtaining consciousness, um, you know, human beings will be able to master multiplicity in the world. I would not go into details, and through the through mastering multiplicity ma to master time. And he also talked about absolutely scientific resurrection, resurrection of dead people in kind of the very distant, very distant future. But what is interesting, consciousness for him, it became now uh, the kind of central category of the revolutionary anthropology. And consciousness for him is kind of interiorization of the violence. So this, um, this kind of uh, the uh, quotation, if the interest of the whole uh, of the whole require common action, an obstacle to which is the opposing will of individual, it is possible to curse them. But with the growth of consciousness, violence disappearing because it, it became interiorized, it became kind of self-control and self-violence. Consciousness in Russian, saznatelnost. It's not saznanie, it's saznatelnost. Mastery of the time is possible through transformation of chaos, cohesion into free union. So from kind of coercion, from the time of revolution, of necessity, go to the free union, and the instrument is consciousness. But the project, the project as such, project is a bridge between reality and the future, right? When I project something, I have a reality, the world as it is, and I have the idea, the world as it should be or ought to be, and then the project is something with which I bring these two things together. So this is a bridging between reality and expectation, between something which breach freedom and necessity. But at the same time, in projects, we really displace 
expectations. We really displace the future and we close the future. Why? Because when I, when I say that this is not yet implemented, you know, the future is not yet there. I put it somewhere far away, somewhere in more or less distant future. Uh, my expectations not here, not today, but they are tomorrow. And in a way I displace through, uh, through this kind of thinking future uh, to kind of distant, distant realms. Well, and displacement won over a reconnection. Displacement won over bridging expectations and experiences, or as Trotsky famously said, the laden ramp of bureaucracy outweighed the head of the revolution. And what came, came, you know, very dark Stalin's, uh, Stalin's regime. Um, Sorry, don't have time, so I just very sketchy. Um, you know, Stalin basically introduced the, the idea of the socialism in one country, um, and, we, and socialism he distinguished from communism. And together with the idea of the socialism in one country came the idea of the rise of the class struggle. So the idea was that the closer we to the socialism, the uh, more intensive class struggle is. Um, these three ideas, uh, raising of class struggle, um, socialism and communism, actually worked for displacement of the expectations, the displacement of the communism, displacement of the freedom to far away realms to the faraway future. So socialism, what is now, is the time of the mastery, the time of the control, the time of necessity, of limitations, of increased class struggle, and of the great terror. While communism, this is a faraway future freedom, power, abundance of, abundance of the resources, far, very far away ideal. So what actually Stalin's regime did, it closed revolution. It closed revolutionary, um, a revolutionary horizon of, uh, of expectations. Um, Okay, I skip this also. There are some interesting philosophical uh, thoughts here, but just one thing. Um, now, the delay should be explained. The time of Stalin's regime was understood as a time of delay. Why communism, why world revolution did not happen? why communism did not come. And this, uh, this question has been asked by many people. Averroes or Al-Ghazali asked uh, why God delayed with creation of the world. He decided in eternity and then created it in the time. Why this was delayed? Or Anselmus of Canterbury asked why God delays with the salvation of the people, and he had his very elaborate answer to that. For the communists, the problem was why um, communism is delayed, why not tomorrow? And the answer was again in consciousness. The consciousness is not developed yet. We are still subject to blind forces, to spontaneity, to instinct. We still don't have enough self-control. We are influenced by the bourgeois ideology. So we are not interiorized the violence yet. So violence should be external. Violence should be 
in the form of the terror. Um, when we interiorized the terror, when we became conscious, then, you know, uh, then, then communism comes. So consciousness now in Stalin time started working as the instrument of displacement. Khrushchev time, 1960s, tried to galvanize revolution. Um, and uh, it did through, you know, basically claiming that communism is very close. Um, Khrushchev claims that in 20 years, we will build communist society, that the present generation will live under the communism. So radical imagination again opened up. And that's why in the 60s, we have all this um, romantic understanding of freedom, of autonomy, of, uh, you know, this is a time of the science fiction in Russia. This is a time of the time capsules to the future generation who would live in the communist society. This is a time of romantic cinema, new poetry, and all this, all this stuff. So for example, in 1967, in one of the time capsules, they put the note saying that we believe, and you know, it, it should be taken in uh, the 100th anniversary of the revolution in 2017. So how they imagined 2017. We believe that you beautifully equipped our wonderful blue planet of Earth, mastered the moon, landed on Mars, that you continue the storming of the space that had been started by the people of the first 50 years of the revolution, and that your ships already for a long time are navigating the galaxy. Okay, so this was kind of radical imagination of very near future. But this was basically not uh, persuasive. And what we started to have in Brezhnev time, what we are having now, and what actually all countries of global north, of Euro what can all countries of, uh, of Europe are having now is the uh, situation of the eraser, erasing of the expectation. We don't, need, we don't have future anymore. We don't have expectations for the future anymore. This is the old world, which cannot be, I would say, galvanized again. Well, the present time is characterized now by the crisis of expectation and the race of the future. Well, people, all people, you know, in general, they are thinking, they are seeking intensification of the experiences. Not, they are not talking about future anymore, about expectation. They are talking about consumer society. They, they have this, you know, present day um, pleasures and experiences, you know, through tourism, hence, you know, the development of tourism all over the world, et cetera, et cetera. Well, basically, mortgage is a, a really effectively buying present experience with the future money. So, and this is just destroy, dist, I mean, mortgage destroys the future because you always pay for what you have now, all your life. Um, in this world, science fiction is not popular anymore. It gave way for fantasy. And fantasy is very different from science fiction because science fiction is oriented towards the future while fantasy is about something distant in, um, in conceptual uh, terms or in, in spatial terms, but it's not really our future. It's not about the future. There is a huge difference. So, a race of the future, at least in Russia, led to the mythologization of the past. Um, you know, serious Russian literature, it all now is about Gulag, Second World War, you know, and, 
and probably that's it, you know, two or three events in the past. Um, it's not about future anymore. And this past is also mythologization. Okay, so there is a mythologization of, the, of, this, of this experience. So you have myth about the past, you don't have future anymore, and you don't have time anymore. We are living in timeless society. We have this eraser of the time. And this eraser of the expectation, erasure of the time seems to mark the end of the long revolutionary period in European history. And I actually don't see how in these societies revolutions would be possible you know, anymore inside this, in the framework of this particular imaginary. Thank you very much, and I'm sorry I am terribly late with the end. Thank you, but I'm ready to answer your questions. Thank you so much, Professor Komiakov. Now it's time to have some question and answer interactions. Is there any question from any audience participants? Please raise your hand or you can just uh, turn on your mic and speak directly. Okay, so as the audience I asked, uh, does the relevance of Messianic time for post 1789 revolutionary context suggest that we should see this revolution as continuing this long millenarian history more than as an exceptional and or new modernity? Well, this is what I tried actually to say that, well, I think it's wrong. I mean, some people are trying to do that. And, uh, you know, Slyoskin, for example, is exactly trying to do that. He, he does not see, you know, anything new in, um, in uh, you know, modern revolutions. I would say, well, this is a useful analogy for understanding structural characteristics of the revolutionary time. But it does not mean that, you know, revolution is or Bolsheviks is millenary sect, St. Paul is Lenin of, uh, you know, uh, first century, or Lenin is St. Paul of uh, 20th century, etc. I mean, this is wrong, I think. The revolutions are modern, they are, um, they are forward-looking, they are positivistic in a way, they are autonomous. If we are talking about modernity, we are talking about two things autonomy and rational mastery. Uh, so they are autonomously created and they are about mastering the future or mastering the world afterwards. So, I mean, they are very modern phenomena, but I think that to understand revolutionary time, it is very uh, useful to compare it with the messianic time. Thank you. And uh, we had one hands up, Asnat Ali, please, if you would like to speak. Okay. Asnat. Hello, sir. Hello. This is this is Ahmad. Hello, Ahmad. Yes, please go ahead. Yeah, uh, sorry, I, I I missed some portion of the presentation. It it looks really interesting, though I don't know uh, much about philosophy and uh, all about these uh, studies of uh, this this. But it looks very interesting, and uh, I was fascinated by it. And I am just thinking to uh, uh, ask you: Is it possible to engage our students uh, in such kind of uh, uh, lectures uh, in in a smaller scale uh, at our campuses so that our students, our young generation could also benefit from these kind of discussions. These are, to me, it seems very important to engage students in these kind of studies, uh, to bring them towards reading about these, uh, these uh, topics. So this is really fascinating for me. 
I can't agree, uh, you know, more. So, uh, I mean, I just think we should uh, do that and we should kind of create in our campuses intellectual atmosphere. I mean, we can, we, we should discuss, you know, various things together, together with the students. Only in this way we can create really, you know, kind of research and intellectually intensive, intensive university. I agree 100% and let us, let us do that, you know, in each, in each of the campus with different types of the, of the topics. Uh, you know, the more we do that, you know, the more kind of interesting life, intellectually interesting life in, in the campuses would be. Thank you so much, thank you. Thank you, Ahmed, and uh, Michael, please. Oh, thank you, uh, Sohail. Thank you, Professor uh, Khomiakov, a wonderful talk. I, I enjoyed it immensely. Um, I believe it was in, in 1972, um, when the Chinese Premier Cho Enlai was in conversation with uh, Henry Kissinger and was asked his opinion of the French Revolution, he famously replied that it was too early to comment on the outcome. Um, the way you describe, and I think most people would agree, um, with the, you know, the future is off the menu now, but is it really, is the revolution over? Has the time of the future truly passed, do you believe? Or might we see some reimagination re of the future? And I'm thinking, particularly in the context of Central Asia, where we see a certain kind of revolutionary um, atmosphere still present. Right. Um, well, there are kind of two maybe, uh, you know, parts of the, of the answer. Of course, I mean, uh, if we, uh, modernity is, is not over and the modernity is about this uh, kind of autonomy and uh, so nothing is closed forever in this, in this sense. So, you know, any closure mm, can, you know, invite another, another kind of opening up. Um, so this is kind of very general, you know, thing. Um, secondly, I uh, specifically said that I am talking about European, European experience, European modernity, or, you know, global north, uh, however you understand it, you know, whoever you include it. So global south is a different, uh, different build, and, uh, you know, it can be it's uh, it's much more uh, it's much more dynamic now. It's much less uh, consumer uh, consumer society, and it's uh, it's still. I mean, I just don't know the empirical facts. I am not specialist in this in, in in this world, but I think I think it's possible that you know kind of new imagination would come would come from global south, and I think that this is the most interesting region, and the future is with with global south. Uh, thirdly, well, I think that basically we are already reluctant to call 1968 a revolution. Or, well, we call student revolution, but somehow, you know, semi seriously, you know, somehow semi ironically. Um, or the collapse of Soviet Union, we don't call it revolution anymore. You know, this is, this is collapse. So, I mean, the revolutionary imaginary uh, actually already after uh, Russian revolution started to, um, you know, to, to shatter. Um, very important and very interesting would be to include Iranian revolution to this, uh, to this picture and how, but I just don't know, you know, in, know enough about this I'm, I'm talking about kind of European thing but I think it's also very, because it's also modern revolution and this is a revolution uh, in a way it's it's interesting how to uh, how to include it in the, in the picture so this is kind of the third thing so the uh, revolution is pretty much dead uh, you know for in Europe for quite a long time uh, but who knows, so, you know, well, maybe the light will come from the East. Let's hope so. Thank you very much. 
Thank you, Michael. And uh, I think there is a question from Soma. It's a follow-up question from Michael's question that uh, future is off the menu in the global north. What does it take to change that? Uh, uh, what does it take to change it? Well, um, it. I have no idea. I mean, actually, this is this is the whole this is the whole imaginary. The whole the whole world is working on that. You know how. Um, you know, so the 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 how can you know the future appear again? How this horizon can be disclosed? Well, a second French Revolution would. Uh, would be needed, or you know, the uh, light from the east, as I said, you know, something from the global south. Uh, actually, I have no idea. I can't. I can't answer this question. I just don't know. Thank you, and uh, Ramazan Ali, please. Yeah, thank you, Sir. I think Professor Maximir was start provoking, you know, introducing the philosophy and many new things for, for a beginner like myself. So just uh, I would like to, you know, at the last part of this presentation, you talk about the timelessness. So how we can correlate metaphysics with physics, with timelessness, end of time. I, I need just short reflection for my own understanding. So how far the observatory world is important if you compare with the timelessness, please. Thank you. Right. Well, it doesn't have, I mean, uh, thank you. I mean, it's interesting. Um, I'm, not, I'm not sure whether, you know, metaphysical or physical, you know, kind of ideas about, about time are connected or directly connected with the social imaginary of which I'm, I'm talking about. I'm talking about much more um, kind of uh, concrete, uh, concrete things, um, and uh, well, but this is an interesting question. I don't know. I mean, we we can we can think about it, and this is this is a valid question. Um, whether you know the absence of historical time in our society really make us to think in certain way about the world as well, about the physics as well. I'm, I don't know really, um, but this is this is this would be very innovative and interesting, interesting area for research. Uh, thank you, Professor. Thank you. Yeah. Well, yeah. UN Sustainable Development Goal for the whole world be a way forward. Um, well, but Sustainable Development Goal are about you know basically. Uh, in my understanding, they're about everything being, you know, more or less like global north. They don't open the expectations. I mean, well, it's about, you know, the elimination of the poverty. We don't have poverty on the, in, the, in the global north. I mean, this is about developing, development of, the, of other societies, which should be like, you know, so there is no radical kind of expectations about, uh, some, uh, you know, very future which is very different from what we have now. When I'm talking about radical future, radical imagination of the future, I mean this kind of seeing future as very different from what it is, you know, like being on Mars or, you know, kind of uh, uh, navigating galaxy. Um, all the uh, UN Sustainable Development Goals are, you know, more or less inside this, the same, more or less the same, the same paradigm, uh, I think. Thank you. Uh, if the moderator is permitted to ask a question, uh, I'm going to have a question. <laughs> so uh, coming from a country which has experienced uh, not one, but two revolutions in the past hundred years, the constitutional revolution in the early 20th century and then 1978 revolution later on uh, called Islamic revolution uh, and had that lived experience of, uh, you know, uh, living in a society which was impacted uh, immensely by this revolutionary radicality. 
And uh, I have one question that uh, uh, if you look at the history of revolutions, at least the past four important revolutions, uh, revolutions as political projects uh, are quite ironically quite conservative. Uh, once the revolutions succeed, the whole society turned out to be a very conservative society to, to preserve a certain ideology at the expense of any other space for dialogue or for other alternative forms of life. And uh, I want to ask this question that because revolution can also be understood in terms of science, philosophy and art. So the radicality of thought and creating new ideas. Uh, would you see this contradiction uh, at the heart of revolution as a political project, uh, Professor Khamiakov? I mean, exactly. And this is, uh, well, but this is, this is just natural development uh, of it. Um, and this is, uh, this is not only in the heart of the revolution, but I think that this, this is contradiction in the modernity itself. Because, well, uh, let me start from the, from the beginning. Um, you know, the, uh, well, famous Cornelius Castoriadis, um, kind of understanding of modernity, our characterization of modernity is that modernity has this double imaginary signification, double kind of imaginary in a, in um, in the in the bottom, in the very in the very basis. One is autonomy, meaning that autonomous, right? So the self-legislation in a way, you, I obey only the laws which I give myself. And of course I am heteronomous in the, uh, in the nature because I obey the laws of nature. That's why, you know, kind of radical, 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 you know, modernists like Nikolai Fyodorov say that, well, we should rule the nature. Uh, you know, we should exercise our autonomy even of, of the nature. But this is just one side. The second side is rational mastery. So everything should be mastered by our, uh, by our reason. And these two, they contradict each other. I mean, when I'm free, when I realize my autonomy, I open up the future but then this future becomes unbearable. It comes mastery. I try to master it, and then you have the laden ramp of bureaucracy. You know, you have all these conservatives who come and, uh, you know, but then they could be, you know, kind of galvanization of this corpse again. So, that's why, you know, people like Marx, they described this process as, you know, kind of permanent revolution. You have revolution, then you have a more or less stable period of time, then you have another revolution, then you have another stable period of time. So revolution is just, you know, going and going and going in the future. And this is the nature of modernity because when the mastery, you have too much organization, you feel unfree. When you have too much freedom, you feel unsafe. Um, and uh, well, this is, this, is, this is absolutely true. But at the same time, what is, what is really important, all great ideas, political ideas of modernity were born during revolution. French Revolution, you know, is actually what we are now still implementing. You know, all these ideas of human rights, ideas of uh, popular sovereignty, et cetera, et cetera, they were, you know, created by the revolution because all modernity has been created during this rupture of a uh, revolution time. Thank you so much. Uh, we are over time by 20 minutes almost. And uh, if there are no more questions, perhaps we can wrap up the session. 
Okay. Thank you very much. I enjoyed it greatly. <laughs> this is a uh, you know in the midst of accreditation. This <laughs> is very right thing to do is to talk about philosophy. We are going through another revolution, I guess, at UCA. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Maxim. Thank you, Sohail, and thanks everyone for joining. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, Thomas. Thank you. Thank you. Goodbye. Good night.